Hi, let us now learn about a very important concept, the concept of electric fields. You know Coulomb's law for electric forces, right? KQ and Q2 by R square. Suppose I had a charge Q0 here and a charge Q there. Q0 is going to exert a force like that on Q. It's going to be a radial force and Coulomb's law tells us how to calculate the value of that force. Suppose I took this Q and I moved it to a new position. Will the force be the same? No, right? It's going to be a new force that's going to act on small Q. Now Coulomb was very comfortable with this idea. As I change the position of small Q, the force changes. After all, if you think about Newton's law of gravitation, the same idea works there. G m1 m2 by r square. If I kept m1 fixed and I kept moving m2 to different locations, the force on m2 will change, right? So there is no difference between that idea and the fact that if I move q around, the force on small q changes. But Michael Faraday, who studied Coulomb's law very carefully, he had a problem with this. He said, well, when I kept Q there, there was one force. When I move Q to a new place, there is a different force. So that means Q0 knows where Q is. How does it know that? If I kept moving Q around, Q0 is changing the force. How is it changing? Oh, it must know the location of Q. Does that mean that Q0 has spies all over the universe? And whenever Q comes to a particular location, the spy immediately tells Q0, hey, Q has changed its position, changed the force. No, clearly that's absurd, right? So Faraday's point was, Q0 does not know where Q is. Then how can it change the force? So something is wrong. So he proposed a two-step process for electric forces. He said, Q0 does not know anything about Q. Then how does it exert a force? Oh, because Q0 does something to space. Does what? He argued that it's going to put in lines, invisible lines in space. These lines exert a force when Q comes there. Notice, whether Q was there or not, Q0 is going to put these lines. If I now bring a Q and keep it here, this line there, locally, at that point, the line knows that you have brought Q. Because its line is there. So when you bring Q to that line, that point there, the line exerts this force. Now this line is already here. Right? If I brought a Q there, then that line is going to exert a force F1 on Q. If I take this Q and I move it to this place, this line is going to exert a force F2 on Q. So Q0 does not know where the Q is. Q0 just simply puts lines all over space. The lines then exert a force on the charge. This is the two-step process for electric forces. This is what Faraday proposed. Now, these lines are not a very mathematical idea. You cannot use that to put numbers in, right? So, James Clerk Maxwell took Faraday's idea, modified it slightly. He said, lines are not mathematical. Let us make it arrows. So, Q0 does not put lines. Q0 puts arrows. How are arrows mathematical? Because arrows are vectors and you know that you can say 3i plus 4j plus 9k. So you can actually use mathematics to talk about arrows. So what Maxwell did was to take Faraday's idea. Instead of saying that Q0 puts lines in space, he said Q0 puts arrows in space. These are the arrows that we call electric field. So Q0 puts a field of arrows in space, electric fields. And if I brought a charge Q and kept it there, this arrow is going to exert a force on Q, F1. If I took Q and I put it somewhere else, then this arrow is going to exert a different force on Q, F2. So let us look at the two-step process now. Q0 puts arrows in space. These are the arrows that we call electric field. It's a field of arrows. Just imagine field has a lot of plants, right? The same way you have a field of arrows that Q0 is putting. Q0 does not even know that there is a Q. It's just simply putting all these arrows. Now, if Q comes to a particular location, the arrow at that location exerts a force F1. 
If Q goes to a new place, the arrow that is already there in that place, that exerts the force F2. Let us now try and understand this idea of electric fields and how these electric field arrows exert forces on charges. Let us now look at Maxwell's two-step process for electric force. I have a charge Q0 and this Q0 produces arrows all around it in space, including here, three dimension, including going into the board. Okay. What about these areas? I have not drawn the arrows, but they are there. You have to imagine arrows everywhere. Any location you pick, there is an arrow. And notice, the arrows are obviously in different directions. You can see that. But also see that here the arrows are bigger. As you are going out, the arrows are smaller. The arrows can be different magnitudes and different directions. Each of these arrows is called the electric field at that location. So this is the electric field there, that is the electric field there, this arrow represents the electric field here and so on. So we say Q0 creates a field of arrows everywhere. These arrows are called the electric fields at that location. So Q0 is putting electric field vectors all over space. Now if I brought a charge and kept it anywhere, this arrow is going to exert a force on it. So let us take this particular arrow. This is an arrow, a vector. So we can actually talk about it mathematically. So we can say it is E1 vector. Maybe it is 3i cap plus 4j cap plus 5k cap, right? Something, we can write this as a vector. Now if I brought a charge at that location, then this arrow, this electric field vector is going to exert a force on Q. Notice. I am no longer saying Q0 is exerting a force on Q. I am saying Q0 is creating E1 and E1 is exerting a force F1 on Q. Q0 is also creating E2, E3, E4, E5, right? It is putting vectors everywhere. But these fellows are not exerting forces. Why? Because there are no charges there. The charge came to this location. So E1 is exerting a force on Q. If the charge came here, then this arrow E2 will exert a force on Q. Right now, only this vector E1 exerts a force on Q. How much is that force? Actually, the force formula is very simple. F1 is just Q times E1. E1 vector into the number Q. Q is a charge value, right? You know what the charge value is. So multiply the charge with the electric field vector and you get the force. If I take this Q and I move it to this location, here there is a different electric field, E vector. Okay, So if I take Q and move it here, F1 will no longer be there. Instead, E is going to exert a force in that direction on Q. Why did F1 go away? Because now you don't have a charge at E1. Why didn't E1 go away? The electric field stays, right? The electric field is there everywhere. The force acts on the charge when the charge is kept in the electric field. Now the charge has been kept here, so E is going to exert a force in that direction. How much force? F Q times E. So if you notice the force formula is very simple. The force equation is F vector is Q times E vector. At this location you have E vector and so the force is Q times E vector. If I took this charge and I kept it there, let's say that was E2 vector, the force that will act on Q then, if I brought Q and kept it there, then the force on it will be Q times E2 vector. When the charge was kept there, it was, force was Q times E1 vector. So wherever you keep, you find the electric field at that location. These electric fields are different, but they are not exerting a force on the charge. Why not? The charge is not there. So, when you say F is equal to QE, Q is at a particular place. At that place, what is the E? Find that E, Q times E, that is going to give you the force. Notice, E is a vector, Q is a scalar quantity. So, you are taking that E vector and multiplying by a scalar quantity. That gives us the force. So, force is a scalar multiple of E. But if you, you know that if I multiply a vector with some number, the answer is going to be parallel 
to that original vector. So f is going to be parallel to e. Parallel does it mean same direction? Well, in this case, I have shown you the same direction. Well, if it is positive charge, it will be the same direction. If it is a negative charge, if I multiply by a negative number, it will be in the opposite direction. Either way, it is going to be parallel. So the force is going to be parallel to the e vector. There are many e vectors. So you must take the e vector at the location of the charge q. Okay. Now you can think about this. Q naught is putting all these arrows. These arrows are acting on small q. But small q is also a charge. Shouldn't that also put arrows? Of course it will. So small q will also put a lot of arrows. But won't that also start acting on q? No. So charge q also creates its own field everywhere. I have not shown you that. Why have I not shown you that? Because the field created by small q will act on all other charges. Field created by small q will act on q0. It will act on some q2, q3. It will act on all other charges. But it will not act on itself. q0 will act on q. But q0's field will not act on q0. Similarly, q's field will act on q0. Q's field will not act on Q. So the field produced by a charge will act on everybody else, not itself. Okay. So Q naught's field acts on Q. Q naught puts fields everywhere, field vectors everywhere. Everything is not acting on Q. At the location of Q, the electric field that is there, that acts on Q. And how much? The force F is Q times E vector. We have seen that the force acting on a charge Q in an electric field E is F is equal to Q times E vector. This tells us that F is parallel to E. But what happens in the case of positive charges and negative charges? Let us understand that a little more. I have an electric field E here. If I brought a positive charge and kept it there, positive number times E is going to be the same direction as E. Similarly, if the electric field was in this direction and I bought a positive charge, the force vector is going to be in this direction. So in both cases, you can see that the force vector is in the same direction as E. So E and F are in the same direction if the charge is positive. But if I brought a negative charge and kept it here, then I'm going to have Q negative, negative multiplying E. So this is the direction of E. So the direction of force is going to be opposite to the direction of E. The same way, if E was like this and I had a negative charge, multiply this E with a negative number and you are going to get the opposite direction. So force is going to be in the opposite direction to E. So E and F are in opposite directions when the charge is negative. Remember that in both cases, I am using F is equal to QE. So always F is equal to QE is the formula that we are going to use, whether it's a positive charge or a negative charge. Just remember that by using the correct sign for Q, the force automatically comes out. If the charge was positive, then you know that the force is going to be in the same direction as E. But if the charge was negative, the force will be in the opposite direction to E. Let us now take a point P. And if I put a charge Q, and let's say that the charge Q feels a force F, what can I say about it? I can say that there must be an electric field. How much electric field? Q into E must be F. So the electric field must be F by Q. We can use this idea to define electric field at the point P. If a charge Q is kept at a point P and it feels a force F, then the electric field at P is defined as F by Q. Okay. F is in Newtons, Q is in Coulombs. So the SI unit for electric field will be Newtons per Coulomb. Now this is the textbook definition for electric field. It tells you how to measure E. It doesn't tell you what is E. What is E? E is an arrow in space. It doesn't tell you that very clearly. Not just that, it makes us feel like this is a calculation trick that you can calculate E from the force. Let us think about this. Suppose I removed Q, F will go away. Right? What about E? E will still be there. In fact, here right now I have not kept a charge. But there is an electric field arrow here. There is an electric field arrow here. There is an electric field arrow everywhere. When there is no force, you still have an electric field arrow. That idea doesn't come from here. 
right so this definition is a calculation kind of a definition it's useful because it will help you calculate what is the value of the electric field vector but you have to imagine the fact that the electric field vector comes first it is there everywhere and then the force is produced by the electric field vector this is just helping us find out what is the electric field vector but the electric field vector is already there and it is not just a calculation trick electric field vectors are real and they carry energy so if i take a charge here this charge is going to put arrows in space i have drawn three of these arrows if i take this charge and shake it around the electric field is changing changing electric fields produce electromagnetic waves what are electromagnetic waves light is an example is light real of course it's real does light carry energy of course it carries energy but what is light light is electric field vectors that are changing so obviously electric field vectors in space they are real and they carry energy the best way to understand electrostatics is to imagine space filled with invisible arrows a charge configuration a bunch of charges they are going to put invisible arrows all around space these invisible arrows are what we call electric fields they are real those arrows in turn they act on other charges when you keep them there that charge then feels a force which is q times the electric field vector this two step process is not just a convenient tool for calculation it is the reality so keep that in mind